That alone to me means I would rather live here than back then. Uh, I think sometimes we really do take those kinds of advances um, uh, for granted. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. Today, we're bringing you a conversation with James Pethokoukas from the American Enterprise Institute about his new book, The Conservative Futurist, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised. America was once the world's dream factory. We turned imagination into reality, from curing polio, to landing on the moon, to creating the internet. And we were confident that more wonders lay just over the horizon. Clean and infinite energy, a cure for cancer, computers and robots as humanity's great helpers, and space colonies. Also, of course, flying cars. Science fiction, from the Jetsons to Star Trek, would become fact. But as we moved into the late 20th century, we grew cautious, even cynical, about what the future held and our ability to shape it. Too many of us saw only the threats from rapid change. The year 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of the start of the great downshift in technological progress and economic growth, followed by decades of economic stagnation, downsized dreams, and a popular culture fixated on catastrophe. AI that will take all of our jobs if it doesn't kill us first, nuclear war, climate chaos, plague, and the zombie apocalypse. We are now at risk of another half century of making the same mistakes and pushing a pro-progress future into the realm of the impossible. But American Enterprise Institute economic policy expert and longtime CNBC contributor James Pethokoukas argues that there's still hope. We can absolutely turn things around if we, the people, choose to dream and act. Pethokoukas provides a detailed roadmap to a fantastic future filled with incredible progress and prosperity that is both optimistic and realistic. Through an exploration of culture, economics, and history, the conservative futurist tells the fascinating story of what went wrong in the past and what we need to do today to finally get it right. Using the latest economic research and policy analysis, as well as insights from top economists, historians, and technologists, Pethokoukas reveals that the failed futuristic vision of the past were totally possible, and they still are. It's time for America to embrace the future confidently, act boldly, and take that giant leap forward. James Pethokoukas is a senior fellow in the DeWitt Wallace Chair at the American Enterprise Institute, where he analyzes U.S. economic policy, writes and edits the AE Ideas blog, and hosts AEI's Political Economy podcast. He is also a contributor to CNBC and writes the Faster Please newsletter on Substack. Before joining AEI, Pethokoukas was the Washington columnist for Reuters Breaking Views, the opinion and commentary wing of Thomson Reuters. Earlier, he was the business editor and economics columnist for U.S. News and World Report. He is the author of the new book, The Conservative Futurist, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised, which we'll be discussing today. A graduate of Northwestern University and the Medill School of Journalism, Mr. Pethokoukas is also a 2002 Jeopardy! champion. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. James Pethokoukas, welcome to Acton Line. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks a lot for having me. So your book is The Conservative Futurist, How to Create the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised. Other than flying cars, which is the one thing that I always remember from my childhood that was supposed to be promised to us in the future, what is the, the sci-fi future that, uh, that you think we were promised? Well, I think people were promised a certain kind of future back in the immediate post-war decades. Uh, which was a period of great uh, techno optimism, and then of course in the 1990s, which is a also a a, a period I address in the book of really strong um, 
you know, techno futurism, techno optimism. And I think what both those eras have in common was b- besides having certain dreams about particular kinds of technologies, whether it's, you know, flying cars or much better computers or, uh, you know, moon, moon bases and Mars colonies, there was the notion that we would be much, much richer, that incomes would be dramatically higher, uh, certainly in uh, already rich countries, but uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and that technical progress would uh, mean faster economic growth. So we'd be a wealthier world. We'd be a healthier world, certainly. Uh, and we'd be a, a world of more opportunity. There would be there would be new frontiers across technologies and including new frontiers under the ocean, perhaps a, a few bubble cities under the ocean and, and across the solar system. So sort of every way possible, um, it would be a a different world and I and I and I think a, a world uh better able to tackle big problems, which is fundamentally what we create new tools, new technologies to do. So I read the the good folks over at uh, humanprogress.org and some of the other people will talk about the advances advances in civilization. We've heard stories over the last several decades of how many people have been lifted out of poverty uh, around the world. Uh, so in what ways do you see that we have had technological advancement, societal advancement, economic advancement? Um, and then we'll get to the, the you know, the further and beyond that kind of ways that you were just describing um, why we didn't get that and and how we can move towards getting those kinds of things. Yeah, I think um, I, I think that's a really important point because there is a certain story out uh, that over the past half century, there's been no progress, that you're really no better off living today than you were in 1970 or 1980 that everything has gone wrong, utterly flat incomes, collapsing upward mobility, nothing but only thing that's been exploding has been inequality. That is a story you hear. That is a story uh, that uh, you see in a lot of books. Uh, It is a story being told, for instance, in a book that came out about the same time as mine, uh, a book by David Leonhardt uh, of the New York uh, Times. Um, That is not the story of my book. Uh, my story is is a story of things have not been terrible by any means, but they could have been better. We've had growth, but growth could be, be could have been much much faster. Certainly, certainly compared to our expectations, but also to reality. But that being said, I would rather live today than in you know than in two thousand or nineteen ninety or nineteen eighty uh, and nineteen seventy. So it's a story of of a downshifting in growth and progress, but not utter stagnant. You often hear the phrase, we've experiencing a long stagnation. And I, I mean, I've used that phrase as shorthand myself, but it also misses something, that, that there has been progress. People are better off across a number of ways. And certainly, I think, as you alluded to, global poverty has declined substantially. Extreme poverty, it's really almost a secular miracle when you have a, able to move a billion people out of out of deepest poverty. So in those real ways, uh, there has been progress. What I'm saying is the exact things that create those kinds of progress, such as, you know, uh, countries opening themselves up to the global economy, uh, as happened in China and to an extent in India, like there is a huge impact a huge positive impact. Again, n- far fewer people really uh, suffering that kind of extreme material deprivation. So that so that has happened. But again, compared to, I think, where people expected us to be and where we could be, that is, that is the story of half my book. And I don't want to repeat that. So that's been like the last 50 years. And I don't want, so it's been a, you know, a pretty sizable chunk almost my entire life. I don't want the rest of my life uh, to be uh, to do also be during a period of what I call the great downshift. There's a joke in the kind of circles that I think we run in that I'm sure you've heard that it used to be that the uh, the right wants to live in the 1950s and the left wants to work there. Although increasingly more people on the right want to both live and work in the 1950s. What where does that kind of you know sentimentality about the past? 
outcome versus the forward lookingness that I think you were uh, you've been describing because there, there's definitely if you look at media and art, um, particularly as you reference sci-fi in the title, right? Those kinds of depictions of what this super cool future is going to look like. There was a, uh, definitely a forward lookingness, I think, that you saw in the 50s and the 1960s about what the future was going to hold. And he, fast forward now to the 2020s, and there does seem to be this kind of you know, look dissatisfaction with where we are and how we are right now and looking backwards at the, you know, the salad days of the 1950s and a leave it to beaver kind of environment where, you know, the, maybe this is, I, I guess my question is like, where, where do you think people's sentimentality sh is shifted from this forward lookingness to the sentimentality about the past and what we've lost rather than what the future could hold? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, you know, I certainly have a certain sentimentality and nostalgia for the world uh of my youth um then uh, and then I, I i recall going back to my old neighborhood with my kids one time and looking at our house the house i grew up in and my kids said you were way poorer you know of course like every parent i'm like oh i had it so tough but they're like no you you were too optimistic you're actually way worse <laughs> way worse off i mean i didn't think of it at the time necessarily but what, that was your house i go trust me if you could have seen the kitchen the no air conditioning uh you would really you'd really think i had it tough so i think part of it is people are are naturally nostalgic about the past i think they're nostalgic about certain social arrangements and i think that's kind of really a a personal preference uh perhaps uh, you know, which I, you know, which maybe not necessarily be my, my, my personal preference. And I think it's people who don't have, don't go back, who, who, who would spend about a day back then and be like, I don't want this. Like I, <laughs> listen, when, when, when President uh, Eisenhower had a, he had a heart attack in the fifties. And I think what they did, they, they, I think they may have given him aspirin. I'm not sure they could do anything other uh, than that. So, um, Certainly, anyone who suffered any who, uh, uh, my gosh, before allergy medicine, no, thank you. Like that, that alone to me means I would rather live here than back then. Uh, I think sometimes we really do take those kinds of advances um, uh, for granted. But you know, we've also been through a a really, and in a very negative way, an economically disruptive period. You know, since about two thousand seven, where we had. Obviously, the financial crisis and a very kind of slow recovery. Then we've also gone. We went through this period with the pandemic, where we had a shutdown again. A ma another massive economic shock. So that is that is the thing. Those are the things most recent. Boy, I mean, forget about the fifties and sixties. I mean, most people, the nineteen nineties. Oh my gosh, that was that's before the turn of the century. So we've gone through these two very bad disruptive economic shocks. And I think naturally people are wondering, like, like, is it all worth it? Like, maybe I would like to take a break, <laughs> maybe less, less volatility. And if people don't think that during a period of rapid economic growth, there's going to be disruption, but people see like what they're getting for it. Like in the 90s, we had very rapid wage growth. It was also a period of increasing inequality. But with all, when all boats are rising, people really don't care as much that, you know, maybe some boats are rising than others. So I think an inability to see how all this sort of broad disruption has made your life better and then not having a very clear, realistic image of how, how the future would be better if, say, we had faster economic growth and greater tech progress. I mean, you see this with AI where when chat GPT came out you know, a year ago, very briefly did we focus on how cool it was and immediately we're like, ah, oh, it's going to be take all the jobs or oh, it's going to be like the Terminator. I mean, no one was really presenting like in any kind of concrete terms how this might make the world a better place. So I, I spend a considerable amount of my time talking about that very, very issue that if we don't have a culture that supplies us with plausible images, not of a utopia, but of a better future that we'd want to live in, then why why would we be willing to accept the disruption of the present if we think it won't actually create a, you know a a world tomorrow that we'd want our kids to grow up in? 
you make a very good point there about the memory formation is so deceptive for us. I mean, we tend to remember the things that we really love from our childhood and and the the rosiness of it. With uh, while we just expunge all of the things that, if we were to go back and live through it now, would stick out to us because of the expanse of our experience and and what we viewed in the rest of the world. So that's a point well taken. Um, so describe. You mentioned the great downshift. Describe the great downshift to us. What is it and where did it come from and how did it come about? Just statistically, we saw a slowdown in uh, economic growth and, and particularly U.S. productivity growth in the early 1970s. Uh, that, you know, how productive workers are, that's basically the whole, the whole ball game with an economy. If your workers are more productive, the economy can grow faster. You don't worry as much about inflation. And that productivity is driven uh primarily over the long run about by innovation, tech progress. So when you're saying productivity growth slowed, you're really also saying that tech progress slowed. And in the 50s, particularly in this, by the 1960s, people expected the very strong growth and the very strong increases in the productive capacity of U.S. workers in the American economy. They expected that to continue. So all those, all those like, you know, Jetsons-like kind of scenarios those all assume that what people saw uh, starting in the 50s after World War II and then especially in the 60s, like that was the new permanent state of the American economy. We had figured it out. We had figured exactly what switches to throw, what dials to turn. And it was going to be a never ending 1960s. And then in the 90s, lots of people thought the exact same thing, that by the late 90s, when the economy was going you know, on great guns and it's the tech boom, internet revolution, that the very strong economic growth and productivity growth, that that, is, that was, for the foreseeable future, that was going to be the new American economy, literally the new economy. And uh, when they, uh, I use an example of the book of, uh, I, I had held on to this economic report from Lehman Brothers from December 1999, where Lehman Brothers, it was called like the decade ahead. They said the next decade is going to be just as fantastic as the past five to seven years, rapid growth, tech boom. If you like, if you love 1999, you're going to love the next 10 years. And of course, Lehman Brothers didn't make it another 10 years. I mean, they, the company had to collapse during the financial crisis. Uh, so, so we didn't get that. So we had these, so that was like the second downshift. So we've had these two downshifts together, which are called the great downshift. And hey, listen, one reason is, listen, uh, you know, progress is hard. And we had created a lot of great new inventions over the previous hundred years, from electrification to the chemical industry to, to um, uh, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, the movie industry, communication, satellites. And we had sort of extracted a lot of the easy growth gains from those technologies. and. To continue getting that growth, we had to come up with lots of new fantastic technologies, and we didn't do that. Uh, we didn't replace those. Uh, and why didn't we replace those? Well, I mean, I think, I think technology has its comes at its own pace, but I, I think certainly there were a number of public policy decisions from uh, spending uh, less money on science research to how we regulated, especially in the real in the real world. You know, being able to build things. I think those are two. I think big reasons that led to that downshift being a sustained circumstance decade after decade. Uh, people at first thought it was, you know, economists at first thought it was a temporary thing. It is made ca caused by the oil shocks. But here we are now, you know, half century later, and we have an economy with a potential far less than anybody in the 60s or the 90s would have imagined. To what extent do you think? you know, events, dear boy events, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, exigent circumstances. So we talked about the 19, the 50s leading into the 1960s and the hope and optimism. And then by the end of the 1960s, you have political violence and political assassinations in the Vietnam War. And that leads into the 1970s and Watergate and this huge disruption in public trust uh, that happens in the 1970s. Uh, go again to the 1990s and, you know, a decade that I actually did live through. And you get into the early 2000s and in 2001 you have 9/11 and then you have the war on terrorism and the the the, the environment that existed post 9/11 
And while you had this big kind of rallying around the flag effect that happened immediately after that, you know, you did have airport TSA security and surveillance and, and all of these other things that have really, I think, really weighed heavily on people in a way that I, I don't know that I've even fully processed at this point. To, to what extent did those kind of exigent shocks really turn people's attitude um, I, I'm thinking about this in part because I interviewed uh, earlier today, and this is going to disrupt the space-time continuum of this <laughs> podcast for a moment here, because the other interview I did is not coming out for a while. But right. I interviewed your AI. I, I, I sense, I sense, I sense a tremor. A tremor yeah, um, I interviewed your AI colleague uh, Tim Carney about his upcoming oh, book yeah. and uh, Family Unfriendly, and. You know, people don't have kids without a sense of hope and optimism about the future. So what extent do you think that those things like the 60, late 60s into the 70s and the attitudes that were formed around what was going on in the world, 9-11 in the 2000s, the financial shock that the, what was formed around the, the attitude that was formed around all of that, what extent did those attitudinal changes impact the possible trajectory of where we could be going in the future? You know, you know, it's, it's it's really interesting. Like, sort of, my top of the, I have a, like a, a deeper answer. But just when you were saying that, I was thinking um, that I I remember that by sort of the late seventies, early eighties, there was such a huge pessimism about the future of America. We had, you know, a lot of shocks. You know, you had right a lot of the ones you mentioned from economic shocks, inflation, and Watergate, and the Iran ha hostage crisis. But it really did not take too long. That by the mid '80s, yeah. people thought something very different. When that you know, when you have when when all of a sudden you have a ton of growth and those those economic circumstances look better, it doesn't really take that long. And that happened in the '90s, which I write about the book. In the early '90s, there was a ton of pessimism. You would think there wouldn't have been. We just won the Cold War, but there was a ton of pessimism. And just as people were reaching peak 1990s pessimism. The economy absolutely took off. And a few years later, it was like the go go 90s. Um, but when I, uh, one of the things that led me to write the book was an interesting uh, paper by an economist at Yale who, who noticed that. You know, in the early uh, in the early seventies, we start we stopped spending as much like on infrastructure, and we started to lose control of the uh, of our budget. And from that, he concluded we had become a less future oriented, future conscious society. I mean, if you're not thinking about like paying back debt, then if you're not thinking about your infrastructure, it's like not fixing your roof. You're just not really thinking about the future anymore. And he ran through a long list of shocks. He's like, what, you know, why, why did that happen? Why did, why did we become perhaps less future oriented starting in the early seventies? Uh, and he, you know, ran through every single thing from Vietnam to, you know, the, the women's rights movement. Was it this? Was it? And he's like, I, he goes, I don't know if it's an answerable question. Um, but I, though I, 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 I wrote a long book trying to answer several questions, including, including that one. And while I didn't go into the book wanting to really talk a lot about, uh, I think, the environmental movement of the 50s and 60s, I have to put some of the blame uh, on them, which you had a movement which basically said uh, growth is bad. We are ruining the planet. Uh, we have to live more poorly. Everything you like about the world is actually making it worse. You, you know, forget, you know, what 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 I refer to as sort of techno capitalism, we can't do it anymore. And to send that message that even having kids is bad for the earth. So even if something as simple and natural as having children, that's hurting. Forget about you know what what kind of uh, you know uh, you know what's coming out of the tailpipe of a car. Even having kids is bad. And that message, uh, which was absorbed by our society, which seemed to fit in very well with sort of the economic troubles of the time, which seemed to fit in very well with you know, the Vietnam War where, gosh, look, look at it. It's all all these terrible weapons being created by American corporations. You know, you know, the uh, the bad the stuff they're putting in rivers here is it, it's kind of like the Agent Orange they're dropping on Vietnam. It's it's all wrong. You know, uh, government and the private sector and universities. What one what one technological analyst back there called the mega machine was that was gobbling up the earth and ruining it. And I think that message, which I think is was end up being imbued in a lot of lawmaking which is which became enmeshed 
in a very negative culture, which began to always portray the future as a dystopia. Uh, I, th I think there's a, a huge chunk of blame goes on that attitude, which which is today. I mean, you, you still see it today, whether, I mean, you have environmentalists who've sort of ignored like a nuclear renaissance or huge, you know, advances in nuclear fusion or geothermal, and they haven't changed their story. It's still, we're having too many kids. Capitalism and technology are all ruining the earth. Um, and I mean, no, no, I mean, no wonder so many kids have such a negative view about tomorrow because they're repeatedly told that it's already been ruined. Well, you reminded me of a great bit from the comedian Louis C.K. talking about how, you know, ev everything's awesome and no one's happy. You know, people complain about like the Wi-Fi being out on the plane or whatever. Oh, what happened after that? Did you fly through the air? <laughs> um, you know, which is pretty incredible and pretty and pretty awesome. But as you were saying that, too, I, I think about some of the even some of the purveyors of the vision of what the future could be. I'm thinking in particular Elon Musk, and I, want, I do want to dial back from that a little bit just because I, I want people to kind of close out of their minds for a second the Twitter era Elon Musk that uh, I don't really want to talk about and, and that I never liked because I think it's a distraction from the really cool stuff that he was doing I, before I, I, that. I agree. Um, you know, it was like for for heaven's sake, please don't try to fix that, you know, hell site bird app, just try to get us to Mars. But there was this weirdness. And I, I think the guys at, at Reason Magazine even did a video kind of referencing this where it's like, here's a guy who's willing to spend a lot of the money that he had made himself. And yeah, there's some corporate welfare queen stuff in there that we can set aside again for a moment here. But I'm going to pour all of this money into this SpaceX project with the whole idea of being, you know, reusable rockets and getting us back into space and building colonies on Mars. And part some of the reaction was he was kind of weirdly hated for it. And I never quite understood where that opprobrium was coming from, considering that it used to be this kind of great investment in what the space exploration and what all of that meant for the future. And along comes a guy who says, you know, like I have the same plan. I want to get us to Mars and he's going to do this. And, you know, yeah, there's some polarizing things about him and he's kind of a weird dude, but people seem to get angry about it. Or even Tesla is a fulfillment of something that people in certain political constituencies said they wanted for a long time. Here's an electric car that's fairly affordable and looks cool and People got mad about it, uh, the ones who were seemingly deeply concerned about the environment, uh, maybe because it took electric cars out of being a status symbol and democratized it too much. Um, why, why do you think there's this we, – we negatively view people who are trying to offer a vision of the future like that and we react seemingly with this cynicism and, and almost dislike of that towards them? Obviously, there's – sort of a political thing that now people view him as kind of a person of the right, not the left. So I think think that's possible, uh, one possible reason. Yeah, one of the reasons I wanted to separate the, the Twitter era of it from the rest. Yeah. Uh, there's always been a group of people going back to Apollo who did not want to spend money, uh, certainly not government money. And if you think that Elon Musk's fortune should actually be be become government money through some sort of wealth tax. It's really not for if you think that, then it's, there's really no difference. Uh, those people, th those sorts of people, and sometimes they're the same people, uh, aren't going to like SpaceX. They didn't like Apollo. They're not going to like SpaceX. And if you fundamentally think that, and, and and again, I think it does come down to your own personal preference of what you would like the world to be. Uh, you are are going to be against anyone who wants to create a different a vision of the world, a vision where, you know, everybody can be caught. Everybody can live like a Westerner. We'll all have a lot of material goods and we'll have, you know, more cities and taller cities. Maybe you don't like cities. Maybe your vision of the future is one where it's very pastoral and simple. And that's and that and you turn what is a personal preference into what you think. The future must be, and everyone must conform to that future. And that's what we saw also in the 1970s, was a certain vision of, the, it's not that people didn't have a vision of the future, but it was a vision that was very different than where the world seemed to be going. And again, I think there are people with a, a certain 
uh, like there, there, there's a, there's a, there's a futurist strain called solar punk where it, which is, it's mostly, I think a, a literary and artistic genre. Uh, but there are people who, um, you know, approach from a kind of like a public policy economic point of view in which the future is one of all, if you've seen the pictures online, it's where man and nature have sort of, you know, our, our cities are made out of tree. I mean, skyscrapers are made out of trees, and there's wind, and there's these beautiful, lovely anime-looking windmills, and it's a yeah, so it's a kind of emerging. It looks mildly futuristic, but yet it's also a very na- and people are like, well, that's what we would like, and that's not where we're going. So I, I would like that future, but then like, like who's like who's building those windmills, and like where's the who's mining the lithium for the batteries? For all these solar, you know, solar panels, but they don't really think that far. So it's a certain, I think, narrow vision of the future that people want, and they don't want what the the version of the future where it's where it's like rockets and it's and it's fusion reactors and it's you know and it's you know bigger maybe it's bigger cities with tall. They just I think that is just not their preference. And they view view somebody like Elon Musk as as that kind of futurist, and that's not the future they want to live in. And if they personally don't want to live in, then nobody can live in it. I think you see that particularly in environmental questions and climate change questions, where the uh, solutions that are often offered up for climate change have to do with pulling back economic progress and making us poorer so that we can live in better balance with the earth rather than thinking about things like geoengineering as a way of addressing something like climate change. Homes made out of mushrooms. Right. New homes made out of out of fungus. Uh, that, that kind of thing. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no. Uh, that, that, that That's, I, I think, kind of exactly it. People think there's this natural reaction amongst some people to think about, you know, it, oh, this is, I guess, where I could lead into a question about, like, the, does a romanticism about the past always seems to, you know, I come back to that. We have this romantic view of, you know, we live in this, um, and I know you've, uh, Jonah Goldberg has interviewed you, and he wrote a whole book about this, that so we have this you know, romantic view of, of the past and this unnatural capital demo liberal democratic capitalist way of living right now that makes people a little bit uncomfortable. And as a result, they think there's just a more natural way to live, uh, which coincided with a poorer way to live. Um, And we look at a lot of them look at solutions that take us back rather than something like geoengineering for to address climate change problems that would move us forward. I I mean, a a lot of these people, there's a there's a strong sort of left wing, you know, socialist you know, theme running through these visions. And I mean, I can understand it. Like if, if you, if you, if you look at the world and what's become of the world, you'll think, okay, uh, maybe like a socialist economy really can't be as productive and create as much growth as a capitalist economy. But but wait, what if that stuff's bad? (laughs) I'm going to, now I'm going to like focus on, I'm going to call all that bad. So my, my preferred kind of socioeconomic structure the fact that it cannot produce rapid growth that's actually a strong suit and I, i'm going to promote it by saying we don't need that anyways and it's bad for the earth we can live in a simpler way again of houses made out of fungus and the reason i keep coming back to that because there, there was a huge um at the smithsonian here in washington dc in which they had a huge uh, exhibit about the future and it was that kind of future. It wasn't a future of of of, of 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 mastering the solar system and and of rapid, you know, rockets and all, all that. You know, and it was it was a future of uh, of literally houses made out of mushrooms or learning how to recycle the water from your uh, your, your your wash machine. And it was this very kind of earthy maybe a best solar punk kind of 1970s vision, the kind of hippie commune vision of the future, and which reflects people's personal preference, political preference. And that's fine. If you want to live like that, you can, but let the, let the rest of us like live longer and healthier and richer and be able to prevent asteroids from hitting our planet and be able to, you know, uh, you know, stop pandemics in their tracks. And, uh, that's the future I want. And if you want to, if you want to live some other way, that's fine. Just don't impose it on me. 
I want to get to the uh, the roadmap that you lay out in the book for how to move forward. I uh, want to ask this question before we get there. So I, I think there'd be critics who would look at the technological advances of particularly the last couple of decades and say that, you know, they have in many ways, you know, the device I'm holding, the iPhone that I'm holding in my hand has uh, allowed me to become richer in a lot of ways. I can do, you know, the, I always said as a, I was a consultant for uh, a number of years um, doing public affairs, public relations, marketing work. And the great thing about this device was um, it allowed me to do work from anywhere. I didn't have to be in an office. I didn't have to be in one specific physical location in order to do all of that work. And the downside was it allowed me to work from anywhere. Um, so the demands of what my clients were asking of me because they knew that I was always connected changed. Uh, there was just a, a marked difference that you could feel when that device was introduced. So I think there would be a line of critic that would say that, you know, we've had a lot of technical advancements. Um, take social media, for example. Uh, we we connected the world and got everybody angry as a result as they met people from, you know, places that they didn't know and found out they had opinions they didn't like. And because they never had to encounter them face to face, they got very angry as a result. Uh, the kind of criticism that says we become more atomized and live separately. And again, a lot of this is on my mind because, as I mentioned, I talked to Tim Carney about his book uh, earlier today. So what, you know, what would, uh, what, what is your perspective on that, that, you know, the technological advances that we have seen, that we have gotten, uh, have empowered us and enriched us in a lot of ways. And I think there is evidence that we've gotten, you know, we have gotten less happy uh, in, at least in parallel with them, if not directly as a result of a lot of these changes. I think one, uh, I mean... I think one reason to the extent people have gotten less happy is that we've gone through an extended period where they did not see their lives getting material better, materially better. I think that matters uh, that you think you're working hard and there's all this change and and gosh, and, you know, and and some of the downsides you, uh, that you have pointed out, too. But like, I, I don't my my my, I, my my living standards haven't gone up. I think that if, if 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 people saw that, if we had growth fast enough, that would happen. I think they would be slightly more positive uh, about their circumstances. I mean, I think a lot of this criticism is about social media. One, I think it's I think it's still super short sighted because I think we're still very early in this new information age. But I can tell you that the other day, you know, I was reading about a great new advance that will help cure. Uh, a lot of people of sickle cell disease, terrible disease to have. I have no doubt that without the internet and the ability to do research faster and to collaborate with people who aren't in the same pace, that we would not be seeing that kind of advance. We would not be seeing probably many of sort of the genetic advances that we're seeing. And that is just one area. I could also point to advances in energy and, and AI. But we don't focus on any of those. One, because they kind of haven't happened yet. So we're still waiting, waiting to get that kind of good stuff. Uh, and 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 we focus on social media, which I think over the long run, I listen, I would be very surprised is that when they write the sort of biography of Elon Musk, uh, that they will end up leading with Twitter. Uh, I don't think so. I think they'll end up, I think they'll end up leading with Starship and Tesla. And and maybe and really it might just it could just be uh, starship. And again, certain people have a certain preference for what they would like their lives to look like, what the kind of lives they would like for their kids, uh, how they want their family structured. And if they feel like society is not as supportive of that particular structure as they would like, then something is wrong with the system. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a that's a view to have. Um, uh, but I, 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 there are people who maybe don't want that, uh, and uh, like you know their opinions, uh, their opinions count too. I, and I think ultimately, it's just very, a very short sighted sort of very narrow look at the world today, uh, and ignoring. I think I think will be a pretty interesting world. Uh, tomorrow. I think there's probably something else in our evolutionary biology that we don't we like change. Look, 
Well, well, we look at we, we look at things and we tend to think of what's the worst that could possibly come from this, which is kind of the reaction of, you know, we uh, avoiding the mysterious and the unknown uh, was a way of making sure that we survived and lived to the next day, um, not going and investigating what that weird roar was outside of the cave. Right. Um, the kind of fearing of what the worst could be from it is, uh, a, I think, a reaction within ourselves just to the to protect us from. Uh, from what the worst of it could be rather than focusing on, well, what's the best that could come of this? How could we use this for improvement? The reason that we have the modern world, it took a cultural change. I mean, the, the, the world that you described and the attitude you described, and there's all kinds of behavioral psychology that looks at sort of risk aversion and status and a status quo bias. But I mean, in a way, for a lot of people, it wasn't worth taking a risk at all. Uh, what, you know, I mean, the world didn't seem to change that much, you know, tomorrow looked a lot like today, you know, that we had other than the, you know, you know, kingdoms rose and fall, it fell and the seasons change, but life really fundamentally didn't change too much. And then people started thinking, gosh, maybe the wisdom of the ancients is wrong. Mm -hmm. Maybe the notion that we can't really do anything to substantially affect our lives is wrong. Maybe we have it within our power to create a different kind of world, a better world. Uh, and when that happened, starting in uh, about the 1500s, and no, no coincidence that it happened after discuss, you know, discovering America, which wasn't supposed to be there. And boy, if the ancients didn't know about America, what else didn't they know about? Um, that that sort of awakening, which helped really feed into the industrial revolution and created the modern world, it was a cultural change about possibility, which is one reason why I focus so much in the book. It's a, there's a lot of economics and public policy and history of the book, but a lot of it is about culture and what we believe about the way the world works, our hopes, our dreams. Uh, that all matters a lot about the kind of world not only do we have today, uh, about tomorrow. We have to be able to envision a world of possibility if we have any chance of making those possibilities come true. And I think there's a... There's a lot of problems. The world can be better. Uh, again, this is not a book about utopia, but it is about improvement. Uh, if you read Deirdre McCloskey's you know, bourgeois economic history books, uh, the, the point of just one of the big things that changed there, too, was the way that people talked about things like commerce and what we would now call entrepreneurship, it just the changing of the way that we talked about these things and the value we invested them with helped create this great, you know, epochal change in the way the world operated that led to, as you know, I heard Deirdre do a talk on this once of the, you know, the hockey stick of human progress where we're just kind of middling along forever. And then at one point in the you know, 1500s, it just explodes and goes on upward. I always liked You would have thought there was an alien. If you all used to knew was that chart, you would have thought there was an alien invasion or something where they gave us, they gave us all these amazing right, tools. Right, right. I mean, because you know, that's something miraculous must have almost almost happened. So lay out some of your uh, your roadmaps. So we, we've had these visions of what the future could be in the past. We talked about like those 50s, 60s Jetsons, uh, Star Trek oriented views of what uh, of what the world could be. And we, we didn't realize it. What, what is in your roadmap? What are the key points of it? that you think could move us in a direction of starting to realize some of the cool stuff in the future that we've been promised in the past but hasn't materialized yet? Two obvious things is to undo, I think, the two great mistakes that we made coming out of the 60s. One, uh, which is to not follow the uh, Apollo program, particularly, I mean, both in vision and sort of financially with something else, or maybe a lot of smaller something else's, uh, that we began spending less as a share of our economy uh, on on really bold, interesting, blue sky scientific research. I think that was a massive mistake and one we have yet to uh, yet to correct. And at the same time, and my you know, and a lot of my uh, my friends in the left, they love that idea. They want to spend more money. I do want to spend more money. Uh, and then the part which maybe they don't like as much is that we need to take a very strong look at the uh, swath of regulations that we created 
with with the best of intentions to help the environment. So not everybody had those great intentions. Uh, some of them just really didn't like material progress that we would uh, uh, reform or remove those regulations. The, uh, listen, if you let's say you want to build a lot of wind turbines out in the middle of the water off, you know, somewhere off the East Coast. Good luck installing those wind turbines on a timely basis. Even more so, good luck building the factory to build the wind turbines that you want to put out in the water. Uh, it t things take too long. They're too expensive. Uh, and that doesn't need to be. And one reason is that we pass uh, regulations about environmental review, and it sounds like a super wonky thing, but it's really made a massive difference in how long it takes to do things in this country, the expense, and 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 we end up not doing them. Uh, and I think we need to look at all regulation through that lens. Does it make it hard to do the things we want to do? You may want a green energy revolution, but we're not going to be able to do it under the current regulatory regime. So I think both the science research and the regulation are really huge components, um, which I think there's, I think, very considerable economic research showing the benefits of fixing both those alone would be fairly massive. Um, you know, we spend, you know, I, I read a lot about nuclear power, but we're seeing the same thing now with AI, where uh, the immediate impulse is to sort of regulate it heavily immediately. Um, I think that's a bad way to go. I think that provides a perfect example of where we had another great technology, the Internet. And I think not regulating it heavily initially was a fantastic idea. And that's sort of the framework. But listen, a lot of the book is about openness. It's about connection. That is how you create growth in the modern world. It is allowing people and ideas and money and things we produce to flow as freely as possible. Letting people connect with each other. So it is an e so so my 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 conservative futures economics is an economics of of connection. Uh, and if you look, look, if you look at like an economy as a massive network and you have all these different like hubs and nodes and some of them are universities and some of them are, 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 are private companies. But the, but sort of the key um, element are you and me. So you also have to make sure you have people who can go where they're productive, who can be educated and trained. I have a lot of it in the book about education. Uh, and th that will. But all those policy ideas have to be have to come along with a different kind of culture and that's almost the easy stuff creating a more pro growth culture a more a, a culture more accepting of progress more enthusiastic of progress uh is just as important but i think it's going to be harder I think there was a saying during the, uh, the the space race about NASA that you can waste anything but time, and you know that that kind of attitude. If if they had to go through the permitting process that so many other people have to go through now in order to build anything, I always think of this when you get these. You know, I don't, I don't know if you subject yourself to uh, how much you subject yourself to Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it these days. But there is a very dedicated constituency on there that is very passionate about uh, high speed rail and bullet trains, uh, which I am, you know, not in and of itself opposed to, but always kind of chuckle at the the reality of how hard and expensive and how long it would take to build anything like that because of the barriers that we have self imposed on doing something like that, not because they are, you know, a natural byproduct of doing that kind of work, but because we've decided that we need to go through all this environmental impact studies and permitting process and all these different things, um, it makes it take forever and it's incredibly expensive. And that, you know, even if we accept the that this is a wise idea and something that we should do, it's so expensive and takes so long that it's never going to get done on the time scale and on the cost estimates that the people who are advocates for it uh, ever think that it will be. It's a, and I and I and I bet you're I bet as you're as you're telling me about that in your mind you have this if people have spent any time on the internet they may have seen this map it is a map of of a future American high speed rail system in which you could get on a you could get on a high speed three hundred mile an hour train in. Vermont or something, and you could get off in San Diego, and I think you would never have to, I don't think you'd have to switch trains. It is a coast-to-coast, north-to-south, you know, that, 
I mean, that that is a science fictional map. You, we have the technology. That's not a technological thing. We could do it, but we would never be able to build that in a way that didn't require like all the money. You know, so you'd have to create a money tree uh, because it would take so long. And and as you see with the California high speed rail, it'd be so much more expensive uh, that it is really a a science fictional type of vision. I, but you know, it it doesn't have to be. Some of those lines may make economic sense, and 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 some might might not. But you can't even begin to have that kind of dream or or dream of this clean energy future under the, under the current American regulatory regime. And again, it's a choice made fifty years ago. Uh, it's a choice. Obviously, we can t- maybe continue uh, uh, to make. I hope. Th- I hope that's changing. I think more people, sort of on the left, or I think, are paying attention uh, to these issues, and hopefully, you know, that will be a, a tailwind for change. I used to live in Illinois, and always thought this was well explained by the high-speed rail proposal that we got. I don't even remember how many years ago it was. Uh, that it would have been between St. Louis and Chicago, and it was going to take something like. You know, I'm making numbers up here so people don't hold me to this out in uh, listener land. Eighty billion dollars over a decade, and it was going to cut like 35 minutes off of the Amtrak trip between St. Louis and Chicago. And it's it it people I think weigh that together and see like you know 80 billion dollars in a decade, and it's going to cut 35 minutes off. And it just seems to be so kind of sad and paltry as a deliverable that they get cynical about uh, the concept in and of itself. Right. Uh, you know, uh, of course, there is a constituency for that white knuckle flyers. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, just like there's a constituency, you know, for us, you know, of, of, us all, you know, living uh, much poorer, simpler uh, lives. You know, there's con- there's certain niche constituencies, uh, you know, for a lot of things. But, you know, in, in a way that's, you know, it's it's the high speed rail vision. At least, at least it is a vision for the future. So, I, you know, if you can have some sort of vision for the future at this point, that's not dystopian. That's not, you know, that's not where it's 150 degrees out all the time and there's not zombies running around. And we, you know, it's the whole world hasn't collapsed. I'll, I'll work with, I'll, I'll, I'll start to work with those people. But unfortunately, most of the images of the future we're getting are, are you know, uh, you could pick any probably uh, Hollywood movie in the theater, almost probably right now, uh, showing that we shouldn't really have any hope. That doesn't really matter. Uh, what we do, we are doomed. Let's close with this question. So you mentioned AI. Uh, this is what the the biggest recent advancement, and uh, we're still kind of figuring out what it's capable of, what we could do with it. Uh, kind of very early stage, and you know, talking as you referenced, you know, movies and and television shows and their dystopian predictions of the future. Uh, the people who make those in the negotiations that both the writers and the actors uh, unions had with their uh, their employers, AI was a big item of concern. Um, that they didn't know exactly how that it was going to be used. And it, it's out of a fear, I think, of the disruption that it is going to create that, you know, it's the it's a, the newest version of, you know, they took our jobs. Um, so how beyond just, uh, you know, rhetorical arguments about all of it? I mean, there are uh, people who believe in this um, in free market economics, understand, you know, Shipitarian creative destruction, the disruption that comes along with that. Um, There'll be disruption in the progress towards the future that you're laying out there. How do we how do we deal with both the concerns about that kind of disruption and the actual disruption that will take place in the time that we have this, you know, these transitions? We follow this roadmap into the science fiction future that we were promised but never got. Uh, let's just, uh, we'll focus on, you know, AI for a second. If it's as important and sort of a wide ranging technology, as I think the evidence that we've seen, at least you know, in the past year with uh, Chat GPT, what they call these large language models, that it is an important technology and it will be disruptive and it will take some jobs, it will take some parts of jobs. Uh, people will have to people will have to do do th- do different things. They'll have they'll have to learn different things. Um, I think that all that is possible. Of course, that's always been the case. I would find it very hard to believe that anyone would go into a job thinking, you know, uh, in their early 20s and thinking like, that's it. That's my job. 
I'll never have to change. Uh, I, I'll never have to learn anything different. I certainly don't. I, I certainly don't have not given my own kids that kind of expectation. But the story has been that everybody has not lost their job. We have not had mass technological unemployment. Uh, we have very low unemployment rate today, despite the information technology revolution. Um, the people of Hollywood specifically, when CGI, you know, computer graphics first started emerging, there was huge concern that everybody in the special effects business was going to get put out of a job. And there'd be like three guys and, you know, uh, guys, uh, you know, nerd guys in front of in front of computer screens doing all the special effects. Well, there are more people involved in the Hollywood special effects profession today than there were back in the 1990s. It turned out that um, that while there may be there may indeed be fewer people involved with, you know, kind of practical, real special effects, there's a lot more people doing special effects broadly. And guess what? Now that, uh, you know, more it's easier to create these kinds of fantastic images on screen more movies and TV shows use special effects. So that we, so there's greater demand. So that so you have more supply, greater demand. People had to learn new skills, but it happened. That was just, that's just one. Now imagine that kind of phenomenon. That's what happens throughout an economy. People learn new things. You know, things become cheaper. So there's more demand for those things. So there's more jobs or there's, they are able to create new things. So there's new de demand for those new products. Um, it's 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 a it's an old economic story, and I have no reason to think that that is not the economic story of AI over any time span that will be relevant for most people. James Pethokoukas is a senior fellow and the DeWitt Wallace Chair at the American Enterprise Institute, where he analyzes U.S. economic policy, writes and edits the AE Ideas blog, and hosts AEI's Political Economy podcast. He's the author of the book, The Conservative Futurist, How to Create a, the Sci-Fi World We Were Promised, which we've been discussing today. Jim, thanks so much for joining us today on Act in Line. Uh, it's been a delight being on. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.